Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see each and every one of you. We're always thankful for these opportunities we have to worship God in spirit and in truth. We're certainly thankful and blessed for every Lord's Day uh, we are granted to be with one another, assemble with one another, and certainly worship God in spirit and in truth. So many things to be thankful for at Sandyville. We're certainly thankful for everyone that partakes and certainly serves the Lord. Uh, I think of uh, our teachers teaching the Bible classes. Uh, Uriah was at the dinner table. Actually, no, he wasn't at the dinner table. Uh, Avia was reading a book to him uh, about Daniel, and uh, the king makes the law, you know, you can't pray, uh, you know, you can't pray to anyone but the king. And Avia was reading this to Uriah, and he just shot up like a rocket in shock, and he said, we're not supposed to pray to men, we're supposed to pray to God. <laughs> so uh, that was, so we are so thankful for our Bible class teachers. Uh, certainly as parents, Sarah and I try to teach as best we can, but there are certain things I know that are highlighted in these, in these Bible classes, and we're very, very thankful for all our Bible class teachers. Uh, I've got, uh, John Life is sick, so I'll be preaching this evening. Uh, he was at the Friday night sing. He's very happy to see some of you at that sing. Uh, but he is sick. He woke up this morning, so I'll be uh, preaching this evening. Uh, just keep that in mind. And also, I believe that the elders, they're going to have their meeting uh, this month, and uh, they'd like to meet with the deacons, I believe, uh, this evening. So if you're a deacon, please uh, keep that in mind. I finished reading uh, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, and certainly there's many lessons that you can take away. But one of the things that I, it hits me almost every time I go through the Pentateuch is, is as we reflect on the Israelites, the Israelites becoming a nation of God's people. And as they are exiting Egypt, uh, God has, through Moses and Aaron, we've had those plagues, and we have them leaving Egypt. And, of course, they're going to cross the Red Sea. They're going to go to Mount Sinai. They're going to go to the edge of the Promised Land. The Israelites on that journey, it always sticks out to me how much they complain. <laughs> It's very, it almost gets a little bit hard uh, when you read through Exodus and you read through Numbers. And it, it seems like every couple chapters, they're just complaining again. Complaining, complaining, complaining. Uh, very bitter. And, and I think that, you know, you think of the Israelites from the Old Testament. You, you look at them and, and you reflect on them, and I think many of us look at them and, the, and we're like, why are you complaining? Why are you bitter? You're in such a good situation in many respects. I'm not saying that it's not hard and they don't have challenges. Certainly they have those. But why are you complaining? Why are you so bitter? And I think that as Christians, we can fall into a very similar trap if we're not careful. Is if we're not careful, we can be God's people that are very complaining and very bitter. And I think that is not what God is after, not at all. And I think how we combat that is actually found in Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, which was read for us by Brother Mickey. So it says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. You know, what do you focus on in this life? Because what I'd like to do is look at the Israelites and see what they were not focusing on and what they should have been focusing on. You know, a lot of times uh, people use this illustration. They say, are you a, a glass half full or a glass half empty? And I think as I read the scriptures, God is trying to put us in the glass half full camp. The optimistic group. The joyous group. That is the group that God wants us to be. He does not want us to be pessimistic. I think he doesn't want us to be negative. I don't think he wants us to be complaining all the time. I think God is trying to get you to be a half full type of person. Let's read a couple verses. I want to look at the Israelites and see what they should have been focusing on. And perhaps as New Testament Christians, these are the things that we should be focusing on as well. We can see where the Israelites made mistakes. The question is, is will we learn from their mistakes? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses uh, 6 and following, the Bible says this. It says, Nor complain, as some of them also complained, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, 
that they were written for our admonition. <clears throat> Upon whom the end of the ages have come. There in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it says, Don't complain like they complained. They were destroyed by the destroyer. Now you think about that. The Israelites, they get out of Egypt, they're free. They cross the Red Sea, they get to Mount Sinai. Now the Israelites are traveling the edge of the promised land. And we remember that the spies were sent into the promised land. They come out and the Israelites says, this can't be done. God says, all right, you don't have the faith. You say it can't be done. You're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Everyone over 20 is going to die. I think as we look at it, the Israelites, at least that generation of the Israelites, they were destroyed because they were complaining and they were bitter. They did not reach the promised land because they were complaining and bitter. They weren't focusing on the things they should have been focused on. And I think as Christians, it's a warning to us today. Be careful if you're complaining. Perhaps you need to check your perspective and focus on the things that God wants you to focus on. Because if you focus on the things of the world and you focus on these things that we shouldn't be focused on, you will cycle out of control. You will become very negative, very complaining, very bitter. And I think that many will not make the promised land because of that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 6 it says, Nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. In Hebrews chapter 12 verses 14 through 15 the Bible says this. It says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness spring up causing trouble and by this many become defiled. In Hebrews chapter 12, it talks about a root of bitterness. When I look at the Israelites, when they get out of Egypt, they cross the Red Sea, they go to Mount Sinai, they go to the edge of the Promised Land, I constantly see every couple chapters, I see complaining and bitterness. And God is not a fan. God is not for the complaining and the bitterness that He sees in His people. And I think that God is not looking for complaining and and bitterness in us as New Testament Christians. In fact, when you look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14, the Bible says this. It says, do all things without complaining and disputing. Certainly God, I think, is calling us to be a glass half full type of people. Where we can be positive. Where we can be joyous. Where we can focus on the things that God wants us to focus on so we can move forward. What were the Israelites focused upon when perhaps they should have been focused on something else. One of the first things I think they should have focused on was their freedom. Of course, if we tried to read every time the Israelites complained, we would be here all day, really. I mean, we'd basically be reading all of Exodus and all of Numbers because it's every couple chapters. But just spot-checking the Israelites at some points. The Israelites have now got out of Egypt. We've had the plagues, and now they're on their way to the Red Sea. They've already been complaining a few times. But now the Egyptians are on their tail in Exodus chapter 14. In Exodus chapter 14, verses 10 through 13, the Bible says this. It says, Then when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. They also said to Moses, Because... There were no graves in Egypt. Have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? In this, not, is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians then we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. The Israelites are going to have a complaining problem. They're going to have a bitterness problem. It's like they can never see the glass half full. They're always looking at the glass half empty. And as we continue, we can look at many places within the chapter even where the people are going to be crying, they're going to be complaining, they're going to be bitter. Now you have to reflect and think about these Israelites got to witness the plagues that brought them out of Egypt. They got to see the frogs. They got to see the blood. 
they got to go through the process of the death of the firstborn. These Israelites got to witness and see these things, and yet now the Egyptians are chasing them with chariots, and I'm not saying it's not a hard situation. I'm not saying that there aren't some natural fears there, but can these people not remember who freed them? (laughs) Can they not remember that God is the one that has freed them already and brought them out of Egypt? Can they not remember their freedom? They are already freed, and they are on the way to the promised land. And yet, their fear and their focus gets the better of them. I think this same thing can happen to Christians if we're not careful. Of course, we have not necessarily been physically freed, per se, but we have been spiritually freed. And you kind of have the Israelites, they've been freed, they can't see their freedom, but they, they look back and they say, well, look at all those things back in Egypt. It was so much better back then. It was so much better. They should have been focused on their freedom. They should have been focused on God. They should have been focused on those things. And I think the same thing, the Israelites going through this very physical thing, but I think the same thing happens to Christians sometimes. As we become Christians, we go through some hard times, some trials, some tribulations, and we start to look back at our old life, our old life of sin, and say, wasn't it better back then? Wasn't it better when I wasn't a Christian? What are you talking about? That's the conversation they're having. They say, it might just be better if we go back to slavery. It might just be better. Sometimes Christians have that same conversation today. They say, maybe it would just be better if I went back and lived worldly. Maybe it would be better if I, if I didn't have to attend the, the assembly of the saints. Maybe it would be better if I could just go back to, to all of these sins that I was partaking of. Are we crazy? I think we look back at the Israelites and say, they're a little bit crazy. They've got the God of heaven on their side. They have been freed. They have been blessed. They are blessed, but they can't see it. They can't see it. I think many times Christians fall into that trap is we can't see the freedom which God has supplied us. We cannot see the blessings that God has given us. You know, as Christians, when we are freed from sin, when we're freed from slavery, we should not go back. That's what the Israelites are saying. They said we should go back. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 6, the Bible says this. It says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. When we were baptized, that old man of sin was supposed to die. And we're supposed to live in newness of life. But many Christians will say, why don't I just go back to slavery? Why don't I just go back to the world? That's what the Israelites are saying here. They should be looking at their freedom. They should be looking at the blessing of their freedom. You know, you think about Christians, you think about sin, being a slave to sin. We know the wages of sin is death. So Jesus really took away the death penalty so we could have eternal life. Can we see our eternal life? But yet we're trying to run back to death. We're trying to run back to vomit. We're trying to run back to filth. We're trying to run back to slavery. Why would we do such a thing? In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. The Israelites can't see their freedom. They can't see the blessing of freedom. They say, we want to go back to slavery. Many Christians handle their lives that way. They become a Christian. They go through some hard things. They say, you know what? Why don't I just go back and be a slave? Why don't I just go back to the filth? Why don't I just go back to the vomit? Why don't I just go back to the death penalty? You really want to go back? The Israelites did because they were looking at the glass half full. Half empty, rather. They could not see the glass half full. They could not see the freedom which they had. And many times I do believe this happens to Christians. The Israelites were physically free. And we look at them crazy in this situation. Why would you want to go back to Egypt? Why would you want to go back to slavery? But Christians do it all the time. They say, let me go back to the world. Let me have another taste. Let me go back to the filth. Let me go back to the vomit. Let me go back to that old life. When we become Christians, we got to focus on different things. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says this. It says, Then if you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of this earth. In this life you are going to serve something. I think Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 17 makes that very clear. You're going to be serving sin or you're going to be serving the Lord. You've got your choice. Who are you going to serve? I'm going to serve the one that leads to spiritual freedom. 
And if the Lord makes me free, certainly I'll be free indeed. John chapter 8 and verse 36. Do we have a habit of looking back? In Luke chapter 9, it actually talks about an individual looking back and it says they're not really fit for the kingdom of heaven. Well, why would that be the case? Well, I think there are multiple things there that we can't necessarily cover all of them, but you think about it. If you're trying to mow or you're trying to do something, or even if you're trying to drive, if you look off to the side or you start looking back, what's going to happen with your vehicle? What's going to happen with your mower? You're going to get off the line. You know, I look back and trying to figure out what's going on with the kids in the back. All of a sudden, my car starts to drift, (laughs) you know. Those who look back are not fit for the kingdom. It talks about that in Luke chapter 9. A lot of people are trying to look back. The Israelites are looking back. You're not going to serve the Lord as well as you could if you just keep your eyes set forward and looking at the things that God wants you to look at. But you're trying to look back. And you know what? You're looking back and you're trying to make a pretty picture, which it's not. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 and following, there... We, we have a picture of a dog returning to its vomit and a pig returning to wallowing in the mire. See, it's interesting how the Israelites try to paint this picture. They decide to say, you know what, it's kind of getting hard here trying to serve the Lord and be free out here and, and the Egyptians are coming up on our tail. You know what, it would be easier for us to go back. Wasn't it so great when we were back in Egypt? Wasn't it so great? Are you crazy? People try to play that. I mean, we look at the Israelites and we're like, are you sincere? Are you serious? You want to go back to Egypt and be slaves again? Really? You think that that was a good life? You know what? Christians try to do the same thing. They go back and they start looking at their sinful life and they say, you know what? I'd like to go back to the vomit. Now, they don't see it as vomit, but that's what it is. I want to go back to the filth. I want to go back to the mud. They don't view it that way, but that's what it is. If you're going to look back, look back the right way and see that slavery is bad, that sin is bad, that it's vomit, that it's filth, that it's associated with the death penalty. But the Israelites couldn't see that. The Israelites should have seen their freedom. You think about a slave that was freed, a slave that was just granted their freedom. You think it mattered what the weather was on that day that they were freed? You got this free slave and they're like, well, shoot, I'm free, but it's raining. (laughs) You're free. Can you not focus on the freedom which you have? Can we as Christians not focus on the freedom that we have? You know what? I'm free, but the temperature just isn't quite right. (laughs) It's a little too hot. It's a little too cold. You know, we would look at that slave and say, you're a little bit crazy. If you're free, focus on your freedom. And you know what? I think God looks at us sometimes as Christians and looks at us like we're crazy. He looks at us like we're the Israelites and say, what are you doing? Why are you looking back at slavery? Why are you looking back at the vomit? Why are you looking back at the filth? Why are you looking back at the death penalty? Look at eternal life. Look at what you have in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's sad, but the Israelites could not see their freedom. You know why, as a New Testament Christian, you're complaining and you're bitter? Because you can't see your freedom. Or you have forgotten about your freedom. Because if you could remember your freedom... You would not be complaining. You would not be bitter. I know we all have weak moments, but I can tell you if the Israelites could have remembered their freedom and say, we are free and the God of heaven has made us free and these Egyptians can come, but we're going to be fine. You know what? That's what Moses says. He says, stand fast. And he says, stand fast because God's going to deliver us. That's what he says to them. He says, see salvation. See freedom. But the Israelites fell into the trap of not being able to see their freedom. You know, sometimes we fall into the trap of not being able to see our blessings. Like I said, we cannot focus on every single complaint of the Israelites. But in uh, chapter 16, verses 2 through 5, we see the Israelites complaining again. Now, now, granted, they've got to witness the plagues. They have their needs supplied for throughout this. They have been delivered from the Red Sea. Uh, at this point, but chapter 16, verses 2 through 5, it says, Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand to them. Oh, that we had 
died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat and, and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill us, the whole assembly, with hunger. You know, we have the Israelites complaining again, and this is not the only time they're going to complain about food and, and basic blessings and necessities. We see it also in Numbers chapter 11. And, I mean, it, it, and honestly, when I read through Exodus and Numbers, it, it almost started to turn my stomach. Because <laughs> I'm like, how can you complain so much? How can you complain so much? But if we can see it with these people that are God's people in the Old Testament, perhaps we can see it with ourselves, is that are we complaining and are we bitter too much? We get to uh, chapter 11 of Numbers. It says, Now when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, for the Lord heard it and was angry and aroused. So the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses when Moses prayed the Lord, and the fire was quenched. So he called the name of the Lord, place a Terabah, because the fire of the Lord had burned among them. Now here we have the individuals complaining again, and God, he, he's not happy about this, so he sends out a fire. You think that this would fix them, right? They're complaining again. God sends a fire. This is going to fix them, right? They're not going to complain anymore. Well, just a few verses down, you get to verses 4 and 6. It says, Now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving, so the children of Israel wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? They won't stop complaining. We say, Kyle, they're in a hard situation. They've been eat meeting this manna for a long time. God was supplying their needs. And if they can't see that God's supplying for their needs, that's a problem. You know, I thought about this a lot this week. The Bible talks about contentness, being content. God has given the Israelites what they need, but they are crying, moaning, complaining, bitter, asking for more. I thought about that a lot this week. Perhaps we're more like the Israelites than we care to admit sometimes. God has given us what we need, but we can't stop complaining. We can't stop being bitter. God's given us what we need. You know somebody who has everything they need and they still complain and they're bitter? You know what we call them many times? We call them spoil. <laughs> That's what we call them. It's like, hey, you got everything you need, right? In many cases, if we're honest with ourselves, we have more than what we need even. We have been blessed even beyond what we need. And I think the Israelites really, if they would be honest with themselves, they could see it as well, but they can't see it. Is that God has given you what you need, but you keep complaining and you're so bitter. God just sent a fire through the camp because they're complaining. They didn't get the message. They say, let's complain some more. They will not stop complaining. Will we stop complaining when God meets our basic needs? In Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 33, the Bible says this. It says, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. You understand as a Christian, all things will work out. If not in this life, the next. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Certainly all those things will work out. But when people complain and they're taken care of, typically we call that spoiled. I don't think contentment is necessarily one of the easiest Christian principles and ideas to adopt, but certainly it is taught. There is no doubt about that. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul is writing to the young preacher Timothy about some of the rich Christians. And he's giving them some instructions. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, the Bible says this. It says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. It says, For you brought nothing into this world, and it's certain that you'll carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these things you shall be content. I thought about this a lot this week. I fear that sometimes we're more like the Israelites than we care to admit is God has given us what we need, but we just keep asking for more, and we keep asking for more, and we keep asking for more, and we keep asking for more. You know, I heard a quote, and I'm probably going to butcher it, but, you know, that point in which you said you would be happy, you've probably passed it many times. What, what do you mean by that, Kyle? 
you said that once you had that car, you'd be happy. You said once you acquired that property, you'd be happy. You said that once you did this, you'd be happy. You said once you got to this point in your career, you'd be happy. You said that once you got here, you'd be happy. Maybe we've got a problem with contentment, and we just have a problem seeing it. Has God given you what you need? Has God given you what you need? I'm not saying that we don't work and we don't provide for our families, and certainly many of us, I believe, have gifts that that we can uh, help the Lord in many ways with pursuing our gifts and certainly our abilities for the Lord, but we can't misplace the Lord in our lives. Not only can we not misplace the Lord, but I can tell you, if you can't get around contentment, you are going to be like the Israelites your whole life. You're going to be complaining and you're going to be bitter your whole life. Because you're always going to say, more, more, more. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 10, it says, He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver. He who loves abundance with increase, this also is vanity. You said once you had this much saved for retirement, you were good. You said once you got to this point, you'd be good. But you're not good for some reason. Why are you not good? Perhaps we struggle with contentment. I can tell you, if you don't learn the lesson of contentment, you're going to be running a long, long, long time. Not only are you going to be running a long, long, long time, but you're going to be running and complaining, and you're going to be running and you're going to be bitter because it's never going to be enough. You're trying to be filled with things that cannot fill you. And the Israelites have a problem here. God has given them what they need, but they cannot acknowledge the things that they have. You want to know why you're complaining and bitter as a Christian? You can see everything you don't have, but you can't see the things you do have. You want, you want to know why as a New Testament Christian you're complaining and bitter? Because you can see all the things that you don't have, but you can't see the things that you do have. You can't see the blessings that you have. You can't see the physical blessings that God has already blessed you with. They're already in your hands. They're already in your possession. You can't see the spiritual blessings that are in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. You can't see what you have. But you can see everything that you don't have. The Israelites were complaining and bitter because they couldn't see their freedom. The Israelites were complaining and bitter because they couldn't see the things they already had. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, it says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things that you have. The Israelites could find every reason to complain, but they could not find a single reason to have joy. They're free. God has rescued them. They have got out of Egypt. They've crossed the Red Sea. God has been supplying them with their needs, but they can't see all the blessings that God's blessed them with. All they can see is what they don't have. And if that's the life that you're in, I can tell you it's going to be a long road. And it's going to be a long road. And you're going to be complaining bitter the entire way. Can you see what God's already given you? What's in your grasp, what you already have? Can you see the spiritual blessings that are in Christ Jesus? Can you be content and grateful with what God has given? If you can be content and grateful with what God's given, then everything else is just icing on the cake. How could I be complaining and bitter about icing on the cake? <laughs> but the problem is, is we don't see it as icing on the cake, do we? That, 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 that's where the problem lies, is we don't see it that way. God has given us the cake, and we should be happy and content with the cake, and he starts putting icing on it. I should be overjoyed. But see, God needs to give me the cake. He needs to give me the icing. He needs to give me the plate. He needs to give me the fork. And you know what? He needs to give me the house, and he gives me... It, it will not end. It will not end. And the Israelites were struggling with this as they were in the wilderness. And I think it kept out of the promised land. They couldn't see their freedom. They couldn't see that they were blessed. And you know what they also couldn't see? They could not see that God was with them. See, the Israelites, they cross the Red Sea. They go to Mount Sinai, receive the Ten Commandments. Then they're on their way to the promised land. We remember in Numbers chapter 14, they send in some of the spies there. Actually, chapter 13. They send in the spies. The spies go into the land. In chapter 14, the people are going to respond to the reports of the spies coming back, Joshua and Caleb. In chapter 14, it says this. It says, All the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword? 
that our wives and our children should become victims. Would it not have been better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return. Joshua and Caleb go in, and of course as we read chapters 13 and 14, we see Joshua and Caleb, they are the glass half full type of guys. They say, hey, they are big, they are strong, they have fortified cities, we acknowledge all that, but we can tell you this, God is with us. And if God is with us, who can be against us? That's a quotation of Romans chapter 8, verse 31. If God be for us, who can be against us? You understand that the Israelites are not going to get into the promised land because they're complaining, they're bitter. They cannot see their freedom. They cannot see that they're blessed. They cannot see that God is with them and could overcome any of the obstacles that they face. Understand this, the Israelites missed the promised land because they were complaining and they were bitter. They could not see their freedom. They could not see that they were blessed. They could not see that God was with them and would be with them every step of the way. Can you see that God is with you? Maybe you need to check your perspective. I think Christians, we can struggle with all kinds of things. Perhaps this is one of your areas of struggle. Where you're more of a half empty than a half full. You can't see the freedom. You can't see the blessings you already have. You can't see that God is with you. Can we see such things? You know, I don't want to wander in the wilderness and die. That's what happens to the Israelites. They say, we can't take the promised land. We can't do it. And God says, okay, wander in the wilderness. Everyone over 20 is going to die. A whole generation is lost. A whole generation doesn't reach the promised land because they could not see what God wanted them to see. See your freedom. See that you're blessed. See that God is with you. And you know what? That's exactly what Joshua and Caleb saw. You want to know why you're complaining and bitter? Because you can't see who's on your side. Romans chapter 8 and verse 31, If God be for us, who can be against us? Psalm 124 and verse 8, Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. If you look at the Israelites and say, Why are you complaining? I think that we have to look at ourselves at some point and say, Why are we complaining? You're free, you're blessed, and God is with you as God's people. If we can acknowledge those things, I think it will keep us on the right path. I think it will make us more of a glass half full. And really, when I looked at my life and I reflect on my life, I come to a different conclusion entirely than this traditional saying. In Psalm 23 and verse 4, we have, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. We're probably very familiar with the psalm. But in verse 5, it says this. It says, My cup runs over. This is not a glass half full and half empty type of deal. When you're a New Testament Christian, if you have your spiritual eyes, you should see your glass overflowing. You have spiritual freedom, eternal life. You have avoided the death penalty if we are faithful. We are blessed beyond measure. Spiritually, physically, even in the worst physical circumstances, we are blessed. And can we acknowledge that God is with us? Can you see it? That you're free. Can you see it? That you're blessed. Can you see it? That God is with you. And if you can see those things, I think that you will be actually following Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, where it tells us to focus on these things. And we can see that the Christians of the New Testament had this attitude. They had this type of thinking. They were not negative pessimistic, complaining people. They were positive, optimistic, and joyous because of the freedom and the blessings and the understanding that God was with them. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. It's a type of joy and a type of perspective that would make you sing in prison. You think about that. It's a type of perspective that would make you sing in prison. We can see that with our brothers and sisters in Christ in the New Testament. It's the type of perspective that can get us through all the hard and challenging and adverse times in life. You might be saying this morning, Kyle, I need to work on this. You know what? I need to work on this too. God did not call us to be a glass half full, glass half empty. He wants us to be glass half full. But beyond that, I think God wants us to acknowledge that our cup is overflowing. 
I don't see anywhere in the Bible where God really endorses or encourage, encourages pessimism, negativity, and complaining. Now, I'm not saying that those are kind of human tendencies. I understand that they are. But I don't see God encouraging, say, oh, yeah, you just go over there and you complain. Great job. You know, you go over there and you be pessimistic. Great job. You go over there and be negative. No, God acknowledges those that were positive, optimistic, and joyous for the Lord. I think that's what God calls us to be. You know, I don't want to see the filth, the vomit, the death penalty. I don't want to see those things. I want to see spiritual freedom, righteousness, and eternal life. I understand that we have to look at these things from time to time, but I'm not looking at them and saying they're good. That's what the Israelites did. Oh, let's go back to Egypt. Let's go back to slavery. No, acknowledge it for what it is. Filth, vomit, death. I'm not going back to any of those things. Say, I don't want to see the next physical treasure. You know what I want to see? I want to see the next spiritual treasure. Don't say that, you know, I, I don't want to see the challenge and the obstacles per se. I want to see and acknowledge that God is with us every step of the way. We as Christians have a chance as a blessed life and a joyous life, but you have to be looking at the right things. Can you see your spiritual freedom? Can you see the blessings of your life that God has given us? Can you see that God is with us? What a wonderful life it is to live the Christian life to have the Christian perspective. Perhaps this morning you need to become a New Testament Christian. It will change your life. Perhaps even change your perspective along the way, which really it should. Perhaps you need the prayers of the church. We'd love to help you in any way we can this morning if you come as we stand as we sing.